At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Well, hello everyone and welcome to another Drug Science Podcast. This is a, actually a really appropriate week for interviewing my two guests because as those of you who follow the strange saga of Brexit will know that it seems like we might have solved the Northern Ireland border problem this week, which is in itself quite a great success. But on top of it, coming with it, we think the UK will be re-engaged with the Horizon programme, which is something that all the scientists and academics in the UK have been desperate to happen because it's been one of the great successes of the European initiative. So today we have two leaders, thought leaders, program leaders in European science, uh, particularly brain science. We have Fred Destrebeck, who is the chief executive of the European Brain Council, and Tadeusz Hurat, who was once part of the Brain Council, is now gone freelance partly working for this new organization called Parea, which is going to be the subject of a lot of discussion here tonight. And I think you also work for the European Association of Neurologists. Is that right, Ted? Yes, yes. It's called the European Federation of Neurological Associations. So we've got a lot of brain expertise here. And tonight we're going to be talking about how we can put all our brains together to make Europe a hotbed of research and clinical development with psychedelics. So I'll start with with Tad, because he is the the brains and the visionary behind Perea. So over to you, Tad. Tell us what Perea is and uh, what it's doing, or at least an introduction. We'll come back to the details in a minute. All right. So I want to start by saying that it's really great to be in this particular company, because we all crossed our paths professionally, obviously, at the European Brain Council. So I've been engaged in this policy space in Brussels for around 15 years. And for the last few years, I've been following what's happening uh, in the psychedelic science. And I couldn't help but notice that while we had great research, we have great research in Europe when it comes to psychedelics, we haven't been really very active in terms of policy and and regulatory landscapes. This was clearly lagging, which is why a bit less than one year ago, I set up this organization, which we call PAREA, this is Psychedelic Access and Research European Alliance. And PAREA, importantly, it's a membership-based organization. So we bring together 17 members, starting with some of the most influential EU patient organizations. Um, So there are patients in the area of mental health, neurology, and chronic pain. Then there are also professional associations like European College of Neuropsychopharmacology or the European Psychiatric Association. And then layering on on this, we also have basically all the leading psychedelic foundations in Europe, of course, Drug Science, Beckley, Open Foundation, Mind Foundation, and then also uh, industry players. So this is part of, and the idea is that uh, we have this wide coalition of actors, the stakeholders who ought to be involved as early as possible in rolling out psychedelic treatments. So that's what, you know, that's the philosophy really to already have this coalition bringing together people who should be involved early on. And what Parea is really after in a way is safe and responsible integration of psychedelic medicines into European mainstream health services. I think at this point we can safely assume that the likelihood of these therapies coming also to Europe is quite good. So the question is how we can start preparing and really ensure an optimal care and safety for participants, start developing guidelines and so on. So this is a bit what we are doing. And also Pariah happens not just to be a collection of first letters of a name, but it also, it's a word in itself, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's a good point. I think it, it's interesting because, you know, on one hand, we are new in Europe. On the other, psychedelics is a Greek word, obviously. So, parea is also a, a Greek word and a kind of a fen cultural phenomenon in Greece. Basically, it means coming together. It's this notion of discussing the ideas to enrich our quality of life. So this is, you know, these are a bit uh, ideas behind also this collaboration that we want to ca come together and have this positive impact on the, the lives of people that are affected by various brain, brain health conditions. Super. Well, that's a perfect uh, segue to, over to Fred, because Fred, I think you've been working for the Brain Council for a long time now. and It's an organization I was very fond of when I was there. Uh, do you want to explain to the audience what it's about and what it does? And and also why you've come in as co-vice chair, I think, of Perea. So tell us about your engagement and the EBC's engagement. Yes, thank you, Dave. Actually, I should start by saying that EBC is no longer so new as an organization because we are turning 21 years this month in March 2023. So we've been active and present in Brussels to advocate and promote brain research at the European level to really foster a greater engagement of EU institutions into the space in the context of framework programs for research and innovation and uh, with time, the demonstration of the unmet needs in the brain space was, uh, was actually uh, extremely important in our narrative and now turning to the need to encourage innovation and enable access to, to innovation in the brain space has become extremely important for the organization. We bring together the perspective of patient organizations such as EFNA that uh, Tad mentioned a moment ago, or Gamian Europe, so people living with a mental condition, as well as scientific, professional and clinical societies, and also the private sector. And uh, we try and generate the consensus in order to advance uh, the recognition of brain disorders and of neuroscience as a whole at the European level. So it is really in this context that, I mean, I was pleased to contribute personally also, as, as it was mentioned earlier, or past have, have crossed in the past and it's great to work again with, uh, with you, Dave, and with you, Tad, but it wouldn't be enough. I think it's uh, also needed to serve a purpose in the perspective of Barea to explore a field of research that is probably under-recognized and stigmatized is for me in a kind of very exemplative place in the narrative that EBC is advancing. Because here we are, we are talking about substances that we know have an effect in the brain, but we never kind of investigated the benefit that they could have. And I'm sure we can, uh, we can address that in a moment. But in exploring that and opening that, that reflection process and that dialogue, we are actually touching upon all the issues that EBC has been identifying as being, let's say, blocking factors for innovation in the brain space over the last years. Well, yes, and talk, we'll take a look, talk a bit more about innovation because I think one of the innovations that you've brought into the Brain Council are the Brain Innovation Days. Tell us about those. <laughs> well, yeah, the Brain Innovation Days was actually uh, an idea that came to us after we realized that we needed to talk about brain research, I mean, in a positive light. So for too long, we've been let's say, entrenched into a narrative where we said the brain was complex, brain, the management of brain disorders was costly. We would hardly find a disease modifying treatment, but we needed more investment into research. But so not, not using too much positive encouragement to our interlocutors. And we thought, so that was, let's say, one grassroots internal uh, needs that we wanted to meet in a sense, but also externally, we wanted to demonstrate that there is a very vivid ecosystem that is out there, that is working on a daily basis to really improve the condition of people living with a brain condition and that these people actually ought to be better supported by our policymakers, regulators, decision makers, and so on and so forth. So creating the Brain Innovation Days was about demonstrating and celebrating the successes in the space, because this is coming, this is really coming, and we've seen a revolutionary treatment hitting the market in certain conditions, and we'd like definitely to advance that. So we also would like to create that level playing field to engage our community, patients, researchers, clinicians, the private sector, but also uh, startups, innovators, investors, and policymakers. So it's really with that ambition that we generated the Brain Innovation Days. 
and we'll have uh, the 2023 edition on the 26th and 27th of October in Brussels. Yes, I was in the last one, and I was I learned a lot. I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's innovation in, in many areas. It's not just pharmacology, but tonight we're going to focus on pharmacology because because that's really what psychedelics are. But obviously, there's also the involvement of, of psychotherapeutic expertise as well. So, so why do we need innovation in the mental health space, Tad? Right. So I think that what we've seen in the last few decades that there hasn't been really any proper innovation for mood disorders. We've just mostly seen tweaking of, of existing substances. And even I was just browsing last week the report from the European Medicines Agency. I will be using the shortcut EMA today, where they were list, listing what new therapies were approved last year. And there were, you know, over 20 cancer therapies, a good number for orphan designations for rare diseases. Also, uh, perhaps around eight therapies for neurological conditions. And there was zero drugs, medicines approved for mental health disorders. So I think this is very emblematic for what we've seen in the field, unfortunately. And, you know, you can then contrast this with the scale of unmet needs globally. But here speaking uh, in Europe, we know that there are 84 million people across the EU that are, that are affected by mental health conditions. And these are the numbers from before the COVID. Then you can add to this, I think, 23 million Europeans that are addicted, that have alcohol use disorder. There are around 8 million people that are suffering from PTSD. And this is, by the way, some, some an area that is not really recognized at all in, in Brussels. It's a, it's quite a blind spot, the PTSD. So some of these numbers, you know, probably if they overlap, but you can still appreciate what's the scale of the challenge here with over, over 100 million EU inhabitants affected, let alone that there are huge economic implications. We are speaking about 600 billion euros that Europe spends every year for uh, in the area of uh, mental health disorders. This is more or less 4% of GDP, European GDP. So definitely this is, you know, if there is a, an area of unmet needs for excellence, this will be mental health conditions. But we also know, and substance use disorders, but we also know that there is some good promise from early studies when it comes to psychedelics applied for some neurological conditions like headaches. And headaches is the most prevalent neurological condition, for instance. So I think innovation is, is badly needed. And I really hope that the EU will recognize it and, and do it soon, because what we need now is more EU funding coming to this space. We haven't seen any of it until now. So this has to change. Well, of course, EBC was pioneered the data gathering on the burden of disorders, both uh, mental and neurological disorders, and the very famous, I guess it must be 10 years old now, isn't it, Fred, the famous uh, European analysis of the, the burden of illness, showing that brain disorders are the biggest disorder, the biggest altogether, the biggest burden in Europe. Is, is that still true, Fred, do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, 12 years old now, but... I mean, our, our expectation is that it's, uh, it has actually uh, continued in the same vein, unfortunately. And we have seen, obviously, acceleration also of impact in terms of DALIs, qualis, but also mortality of certain disorders. I mean, in certain countries, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's are now identified as the first risk factor for mortality in the el elderly, which has completely pivoted compared to, to a couple of years ago. So it's the biggest progression over the last 15 years. But I mean, at the time in 2011, when the cost and burden study uh, came out, we estimated to 800 billion euros on a yearly basis being the cost for managing brain conditions, which is the, which was putting together the direct and indirect medical cost, as well as the indirect non-medical cost. And there we really thought that actually making that case 800 billion I mean, it's more than cardiovascular, diabetes and cancer put together. It's bailing out the Greek debt seven years on a, on a yearly basis. And clearly there is this feeling of acceleration. But what we wanted to do was maybe go the extra mile. So we came uh, with, a, with a study and the concept to really emphasize that the cost was not about the treatment, but the cost would be even higher if we were not able to treat 
or to manage properly patient pathways or patients in, let's say, their need, their need for care. And uh, we came up with, uh, with another study on the value of treatment a couple of years later, which is now closing its second phase. But basically what we demonstrated there with a particular focus on the care pathway, identifying treatment gaps in the pathway and how to, how to bridge that gap was really demonstrating that any spending into the healthcare system and improving the outcome for patients was actually an investment on which society, on which society yields a return. And that every, any intervention that aims to improve outcomes is cost saving or cost efficient in itself. And that was really a fantastic breakthrough for the organization. And again, and for the community, because again, we are trying to emphasize in a positive manner what can be done and the potential to actually change the situation. Yes, well, I was there at the beginning of the value of treatment, and it's fantastic. You've managed to do two cycles, and let's hope there'll be enough psychedelic research for it to get in maybe the fourth cycle of value of treatment in a few years' time. Okay, so, Tad, back to you then. So tell us a bit more about what Piraeus actually how does it work and what does it do? So this is perhaps not a very straightforward way to explain because what we do to a large extent is advocacy, also known as lobbying. But I would say at the very basic level, it's about building meaningful relationships with policymakers. And we've uh, done a lot of this last year and this year. We really met with all the key EU institutions and people who will be involved, policymakers who will be involved in this field sooner or later. So this is, I would say, this is one important area that we covered. We've been also doing a lot of education. One of the missions of PARA at this early stage still, when there isn't really a good understanding of what we are talking about when we speak about psychedelic medicines, is educating. So we've been continuously providing you policymakers with with different updates in the field and also explaining you know how how the therapies work and so on but we've been picking up on some of the most important developments from last year from this year such as the completion of maps trial such as some of the policy and regulatory developments in the US also recently a small there was another company which had an interesting and read out from their studies with DMT, small pharma, yes. So all kinds of developments, we really try to make sure that EU policymakers know about this. And here I speak about European Commission, European Parliament, members of the European Parliament, member states, health ministries, research ministries, health attaches in Brussels. These are all the, the stakeholders that we kind of have on our mailing list and they receive all these updates because I believe that once there is more understanding of what we are talking about, more, more understanding of science, then, you know, support will follow and there will be less friction. We've been also working quite a bit with working, kind of having a strategic partnership with Politico, who, who has been extremely helpful in picking up on our work. And uh, just to give you an idea, I've, I've, I'm a subscriber of Politico Morning Healthcare Bulletin since 2013. Tad, Tad. I think a lot of the listeners won't know what Politico is. So maybe you I should explain to our listeners that both Tad and Fred are in Brussels. They are actually the very heart of the, the, the Brussels process, which is, which is a sort of an interesting community. Not everyone knows what all the words mean. So explain what Politico is, please. All right. I'm doing my best not to use acronyms. So stop me at any point if I... Uh... Don't make sense, but Politico is, you know, it's a media outlet. It's actually Politico Europe. I'm bringing up Politico because just last year, Politico kind of took over, I think, Financial Times. And Politico is now the most influential media in Brussels. 80% of EU policymakers admit that they take, take into account Politico journalistic work when they make decisions. So this is this is important because this is one important source of information and it's a it's a quality journalism. It's not just kind of adding to the to the whole hype. So um, I've been following so Politico has this morning healthcare bulletin which comes you know from Monday to Friday and gives you a summary of all the most important developments in the health space in the last 24 hours. 
I've been subscribed since 2013 and I did some counting and until the Parea launched in June last year, a word psychedelics was appeared three times in this bulletin. Since our launch until the end of last year, it was, I think, 17 times. Some of these were just brief mentions. Many other were actually, you know, articles or speaking about our work and so on. So that's that's something that truly helped us. And then we were also, apart from educating, we started already providing concrete uh, recommendations. And to that end, last year, we first launched the call to action. And then we had in December a high level meeting in the European Parliament, bringing together both parliamentarians, the commission, the wider community. And there we launched a what we call an appeal to the EU policymakers, which provides some ideas of you know what should be happening next and the premises is to make the eu policymakers understand that in a few years millions of europeans may be eligible for the prescription of psychedelic assisted therapies so we should be really asking ourselves some important questions already now because we don't want this to be turned into lessons learned how to things better how to do things better we really want to use the opportunity the time that we still have to to prepare because we know that the psychedelic treatments will not necessarily reach Europeans, you know, in one year. We still have to wait a few more years. Can I ask you about that, Tad? I mean, so why was there a need for Perea? I mean, is is Europe off the pace compared with the US or or other countries? I mean, what, what, why does why why does Europe need Perea? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, we are. I think science is here, even some some major companies, but there was nothing happening in terms of political interest in Brussels from the major EU institutions. And they are the regulators, you know, they are having an important say also in terms of uh, research and healthcare delivery, although this is uh, member states competence, but there is a, a scope for the EU to play, play a role. And then, of course, you know, we have regulators, we have, we have EMA. So Parea was formed to kind of fill in this gap, to raise awareness, to become a collective voice of the psychedelic field in Europe, to become a one-stop shop for the EU policymakers. We've been already contacted, for instance, by the European Parliament, who was asking about some legal issues surrounding research on psychedelic substances in Europe, so we would provide an answer. So it's a, it's an interface between patient organizations, scientists, and policymakers, among other things. Hello everyone, Dr. Hannah Thurger here. Sorry to interrupt the show, but we have something really exciting that we wanted to share with you all. Drug Science is teaming up with the UK's most prolific psychedelic research center, Imperial College London, to record a one-off podcast special. But wait, there's more. On Tuesday the 15th of August from 6.30 until 9.30, we're taking a conversation offline and bringing it to the heart of West London. So yes, that's right. Not only are we collaborating with Imperial College for this prestigious podcast episode, this will be a live podcast recording and you're invited to be a part of our audience. Imperial College is sending us their best and brightest minds for an exclusive insight into the world of psychedelic clinical trials, many of which are not even public knowledge at this point. So mark your calendars for Tuesday the 15th of August, doors open at 6pm and the podcast recording starts at 6.30pm sharp. And as always, our Drug Science Premium Community members will be able to attend this event for free and will even be invited to participate in the conversation too. We'll have a Q&A session where community members can ask their burning questions to our panel of experts. So it's a chance to engage directly with the leading minds in, in the field and ask Dave pretty much anything. Find out how to become a community member by visiting the link in the show notes. Otherwise, tickets are available now. Please see the other link in the show notes. So don't wait too long though, as space is limited and we do expect this event to sell out fast. I look forward to seeing you there. And now back to the show. So the question was, I suppose, we see psychedelic research happening. You mentioned the MAPS trial of MDMA for PTSD in the States, which is likely to become a licensed medicine, say, in, in the States, probably next year, if, uh, thing, if the FDA agree. And we've seen trials um, led out of Compass Pathways and now Small Pharma in the UK. 
what are the hurdles? What are the real hurdles, though, for for, the, for Europe to actually become or take advantage of these developments? Is, is it in Brussels or is it in the, in the national decision makers? I mean, are there particular challenges for Europe that we, as in Perea, need to overcome? Yeah, well, there are there are a lot of hurdles. But again, I just want to really emphasize that they should be always put in the context of the, the challenges, the, the opportunities because of the unmet needs, because how this can help, you know, millions of Europeans, hopefully. But I would say there are different layers here. First, we have hurdles and challenges that are applicable across the board, whether we are in Europe or not. And perhaps it's a good place to mention that last month, there was a publication in the Lancet called The Therapeutic Potential of Psychedelics, the European Regulatory Perspective. And this was co-authored by a European Medicines Agency, by national experts from the European Medicines Regulatory Network, also by the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology. So it's the first time when we have this institutional recognition at the EU level that this is an important and promising field. But they do mention various challenges that they see from a regulatory perspective. And again, these are this is nothing new. There is problem with placebo and blinding. There is problem with expectancy bias. They are they want to know what will be the choice of the dose, whether you know it will be enough to have one or two do- doses, or maybe have a maintenance dosing regime every half a year and so on. Of course, one of the things that they are grappling with is this concept of not just a pill, but psychedelic assisted therapy. And here there are different formulas. We, you know, there's psychedelic assisted therapies. Some companies are having supportive therapy. Some others have psychological support, but this is a, an issue for the regulators because, you know, they, they imagine that there would be a label which could say this medicine is to be provided with a comprehensive psychological support. And then, you know, they think that the, the comprehensive Support can mean different things in different countries, and they want to make sure that things are harmonized. So there will be an issue with harmonization. Also, there are considerations which are relating to uh, post-approval, safety monitoring, but also health technology assessment. So one thing is to have a, a medicine that is safe and effective, and the other is to have something that has provides value for money for member states. So you know we, we are yet to see how so cost effective the psychedelics will be and then there is a, there are a lot of many other things such as that we will need to do a lot of educating towards healthcare professionals for instance so that they recognize psychedelics as regular medicines education to patients and many other many other things that need to be addressed in advance and of course one of the biggest biggest roadblocks will be shortage of trained therapies so we should start establishing common guidelines, standards for therapy already now and encouraging people to, you know, perhaps have a bit of a twist in their professional career and consider becoming psychedelic therapists. So Pariah sits in the middle of this complex web of all the different institutions, the different needs in, which will have to be met in order to for psychedelic therapy to be shown to work and then rolled out. And that's a big challenge. I mean, how big is Pereira? How are you managing to do all this? And who's funding you? Yes, well, so uh, we have different layers of membership. This is a, a really a, a kind of a civil society organization or a non-governmental organization, which is not for profit. And the way we govern ourselves, the decision making is done in a way that the decisions are made by Pereira full members, which are the, the, all these organizations, patients professional organizations, European Brain Council, and so on. We also have what we call para-industry partners who are meaningfully involved in our work without, you know, having a say on on our kind of strategic priorities and who, of course, provide uh, financial support. And here, I think, you know, we are not exactly operating in the easiest times. There is a larger crisis with biotech, with the levels of funding. We know that in 2021, I think there was around $2 billion going to psychedelic uh, psychedelics last year. It was only $500 million, so a quarter of it. And this is also reflected in a kind of para financial situation because, to be honest, we are still far from being a kind of sustainable organization in the long term. So this is, uh, this is an ongoing str- struggle. And I spend a lot of time on, you know, trying to fundraise, but not just fundraise 
and encourage the industry support, but also we would love to diversify our funding base and also receive support from, you know, philanthropic funding from foundations and so on. It's very interesting, isn't it? And I mean, Fred might want to comment on this because I think, Fred, you've set up the European Brain Foundation also to to facilitate funding. But it's interesting in America, there's an eno- you know, we, we should accept, you know, realize, people should realize that most of the, you know, the funding of the psychedelic renaissance in America has been done by philanthropists. But we're not seeing anything like the same level of philanthropic donations in Europe. But I'd be interested to know what the two of you think about that and how we can do something, something to improve things. I mean, uh, do you have any perspectives on that, Fred? Well, I mean, there is clearly a, a cultural difference between the the two sides of the of the Atlantic. Also, in a sense that you would have in the US a tradition of uh, of let's say a low tax rate or lower tax rates than than in Europe. But this let's say this duty to redistribute on a personal basis to the to the community. This is probably less of the case in Europe because we have this feeling that you know governments or public authorities would taxate people in order to, to redistribute themselves and then make the necessary public investments. At the same time, we believe that there is definitely a, a community out there or networks or, you know, wealthy, uh, wealthy fellows that, uh, that could join us and that could actually uh, contribute in a philanthropic manner. It's probably, let's say, less widespread than uh, in the US or other regions. Like, I mean, we mentioned the US, but it could be Asia at the same time. This did not preclude our intention to generate the European Brain Foundation as a, as an independent legal entity to, to the EBC, but with really this focus on, or this basis as a charity to expand the potential for fundraising, but to ensure that there would be a credible and independent uh, scrutiny on how it is redistributed. So it was really important for us to put it on, I mean, put it on its feet. We'll have our first gala event later in March this year. And uh, I mean, uh, obviously the start, this will kickstart the activities of the foundation. Well, I certainly encourage any uh, people with uh, either their own money or philanthropic money of other sources to uh, to consider supporting both the foundation and Perea because they're, they're extremely important organizations. But of course, what, what Europe does have, which in some ways other countries don't, is the is a coordinated research program. I already mentioned in my introduction the Horizon program, which is one of the greatest innovations in collaborative research that's probably ever been in, in the world. And we have hopes, I think, don't we, um, particularly Tad? I know you've been talking to various organizations. It might be able to allow, facilitate the Horizon program taking an interest in psychedelics. So could you just explain about the program and, and how it might work? Yeah. So, as you said, this is really a prestigious collaboration. It was actually Jeremy Farrar who who once said that Horizon Europe is globally regarded as the best internationally cooperative anywhere in the world. And by the way, Farrar, for those who don't know, Jeremy Farrar was the was the head of the Wellcome Trust, so which is the biggest charity in Britain. Yeah, so we have these uh, prestigious uh, scientific collaborations, which on one hand, you know, are well resourced because Horizon Europe is has almost 100 billion euro, euro to distribute. Of course, it's not only for health research, and this is spread over the period of seven years, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a good money, but it's also very prestigious because it brings together these the excellent science, excellent consortia coming from different kind of science scientific uh, centers in Europe and beyond. And as part of it is, of course, health research, all kinds of research, basic applied. There are also other funding schemes like Innovative Health Initiative, which is a public-private partnership between the European institutions and industry. And one of the important areas for PARA really is advocating for better opportunities for psychedelic science within these programs. And we are now in a discussion when it comes to innovative health initiative, seeing whether there could be a project looking at innovative approaches to mental health, which would specifically be designed for psychedelic community. There is very encouragingly, there is a support from the European Commission from DG Research. They actually suggested such project to life science industries, to pharma, digital health, and so on. And what we now need to do as a community is a bit more 
convincing so that we can get for profit partners on board. And I also want to just add one thing, David, regarding the difficulties in funding, because it's always interesting to zoom out. So when it comes to philanthropic contributions, it's around 30% of total mental health sector funding, but overall mental health receives just 0.5 of all philanthropic health spending. And this is the lowest proportion of any branch of health. And these are global numbers. So, you know, this is completely on the fringes. And then you can imagine that with the level of stigma surrounding psychedelics with decades of bad press, you know, if the mental health funding is only 0.5 from philanthropic funding, then how much of it will be psychedelic science? But, you know, we, we very much believe and hope that with kind of more and more convincing some science coming out, the trend will start start changing. Yeah, and it's always been terrifying to me how little charitable money goes into mental health or, or even brain science. It's uh, this is it's so disproportionate. And I know that the Brain Council have been working hard to to make that point. Uh, <laughs> that's essentially what the EBC has been doing all these years, isn't it, Fred? And are we making progress? Do you think people are beginning to? to warm to the realities that in the end, the brain's what really matters for most of us because it keeps the rest of the body healthy. Do you think we're winning that argument, Fred? Well, we do to some extent. I mean, of course, we still, we still consider that more, more or better can be, can be done. But here, I think it's important to point to a project that EBC coordinated and that was actually closed uh, in, in October last year, which was called the European Brain Research Area. I mean, what we've done in the context of that project, um, amongst many other things, of course, was on, on the one side to try and map the investments that were made in the context of the large scale initiatives supporting brain research within the context of Horizon Europe, but not only, because we also included uh, initiatives such as the Human Brain Project, for instance. And we came to the conclusion that over the last 10 to 15 years, it was in the range of half a billion per year that uh, the EU was spending on uh, brain research. But that actually this was an, an average over that period of time, but that average was actually needs also to be to, to integrate an increase. So we have come from the range of 400, 450 million per year at the beginning of that period of time to 550 million on a yearly basis at the end of that period of time. So we obviously were encouraged to see that. But as I said, we, we would like to see uh, more and better being done in the matter. And that's where we the EBRA project came up with a second key deliverable and strategic deliverable, which was the consensus for the priorities in the future and the way by which brain research should be structurally organized and supported. So we really designed with, uh, with the partners of the, of the program and uh, with the consultation of key leaders in the field, what we have called the shared agenda for brain research in Europe. So this is now, we are hoping, the basis for the future action by the Commission, by the Member States in the context of the Horizon Europe program. And we are looking forward to seeing the creation of what is now called the Brain Health Partnership in the, in the early draft and some of the documents of the Commission. But by 2025, we should see uh, the creation of, of that partnership on brain health, which will be a co-funded program between, on one side, the Commission and the Member States on the other. So that means that there will be a greater need again to emphasize the coordination of the prioritization of the brain as a whole, but also then within that space of the different projects, the different uh, subcategories that will need to be to be prioritized in that context. And if I may add that this can be also a, a really important and great opportunity for the psychedelic science. As Fred said, this will be the partnership. The Commission will put some money on the table, but really, you know, the, the Commission hopes that the member states will invest a few hundred million euros in a coordinated research where, you know, there would be some thematic priorities identified. And as much as we cannot, for instance, now influence the 2023 or 2024 research calls, because this is planned usually a few years in advance, we have some signals from the Commission that the Brain Health Partnership 
you know, will be providing us with, with an opportunity to tap into this collaborative uh, research and, you know, have specific projects addressing psychedelic, psychedelic assisted therapies. I mean, I think one of the other points just to emphasize to those who might be new to this field is that psychedelics aren't just about helping people get over depression or PTSD. One of the most remarkable discoveries that's come since the therapeutic value was becoming described is the fact that they produce a phenomenon called neuroplasticity. And that means they help the brain to regrow. And, and they are <laughs> psychedelics are now being trialed in disorders like stroke and traumatic brain injury and in headaches we've already mentioned and, and even dementia so it they may well have a, a very broad application across the whole range of brain disorders and the good news is that we've got uh, on this team here the Perea team you know and the EBC group the skills to really get that that research and, and, and that, those themes properly evaluated so uh, it's going to be really quite exciting times. I think the next decade is going to, I think, transform quite a lot of the landscape in the treatment of both mental illness and also neurological illness. We're nearly at the end. Look, I'll ask both of you, is there anything else you wanted to say that we haven't touched on? Perhaps I would add that earlier this week, there was another very promising initiative that came from another EU body, which is called the European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drugs Abuse, EMCDDA for short. It's a monitoring center, but next year they will become a proper EU drug agency. So we've been also engaging with EMCDDA since the inception of Parea because we believe that they, are, they can play an important role in alerting the main member states and the commission, you know, in the promises related to psychedelic medicines. And they, Earlier this week, organized a it's called a, it was called a technical meeting on the medical use of psychedelics. This was one day and a half. They brought to Lisbon because they are based in Lisbon. They brought here around twenty European experts from all kind of the corners of, of Europe. There were around ten people directly from EMCDDA, and they put us all together because they want they wanted this meeting to inform inform their thinking. They wanted to understand what role they could play because the psychedelics are a bit at the crossroads of different institutions' mandates. So I believe that you know there there can be something formal coming out of this meeting. And one of the reasons also why why they prioritize it because in February there was another initiative that I want to very bri briefly mention. There was a letter that was sent from the European Parliament by a cross-party group of uh, members of the Parliament. A letter sent to both. EMCDDA and EMA, and it was asking them to start doing more in this area and to collaborate. And we heard yesterday from the director of EMCDDA that because they received this letter, which by the way, Parea had something to do with, because they received this letter, the EMCDDA, EMCDDA direct, director is soon going to Amsterdam to meet with the executive director of the European Medicines Agency to discuss how they can collaborate and how they can kind of upscale, you know, their activities and do more. So I just want to really leave everyone with the sense that Europe is waking up and the institutional support and interest starts to pick up. And, and surely, you know, I will kind of, I will take a credit. I will take Parea's credit. I think that we played a very important role mobilizing these agencies to start, you know, doing some work around, around around psychedelics absolutely but to build on the on on Ted's uh, last comments i think that you know this joint effort and and the uh, coordinated effort from the the community is probably what well can be the best demonstration of how to achieve our objectives and our joint objectives which has which is at the end of the day to create a change and uh, improve the condition of people living with a brain condition I mean, we've covered to a great extent the unmet needs that we are talking about. And I simply would like to echo what was said over this podcast in the, in the sense of this joint effort and the recognition of, of these solutions as, uh, as let's say, one, one of the threads that we, can, uh, that we can explore or should explore. And you are part of the chair. And you are part of, I don't know if we mentioned this. Of course, you are, you are the chair of Paria, by the way. Thank you, and we couldn't do this without you, David. Thanks.